I was thinking of uh, the title for my talk. Uh, one of the things that I uh, was thinking of was calling it uh, six decades of work in 15 minutes. And I hope that you can make it in 15 minutes. Uh, I have notes uh, so that I don't uh, end up actually passionately going through a lot of the lessons learned I've had in the six decades and uh, be able to cut it to the, to the 15 minutes that I can uh, for now. Uh, my, my thanks first to Mars for that uh, very nice introduction. I actually don't Google myself. I don't have uh, Facebook and I'm still learning to Twitter. Um, as I tell my staff uh, at the UN, uh, somebody always has to help me with IT because uh, I said, I finished my doctorate using uh, the old typewriter, not, not the new computers. But the reason why uh, I, I, I actually don't Google myself is uh, I simply have very little time. And uh, a lot of the time actually has to be spent trying to manage a very big program covering 128 countries and with uh, more than 24,000 communities that we have to support and work with. And it takes uh, a lot of time, and it takes a lot of, uh, of uh, not just the office time, but also the family time. And therefore, actually, what, what uh, I would like to share with, with you especially, uh, there are, I think, students here, is um, how do you build up the values by which you end up making these types of sacrifices? Because without these sacrifices, then we cannot really proceed with, with our ambition for agricultural and rural development, and especially for environment and sustainable development. Let me start with my childhood. Because it's very important, uh, I'm glad in fact that one of our colleagues who received a prize start, started thanking, thanking her mother. Because in my case, I also wanted to thank my mother. She was a religious person and really took, took me to church all the time. Uh, I didn't become very religious. Uh, I don't pray every day. But the religiosity that she gave me created this type of spirituality that believes that we are more than what we are as physical beings. That we should do what is right even if no person of authority watches over us or compels us to do certain things. That we are all brothers and sisters which should care for each other, including all of creation, following not only the Christian tenet, but that of other major religions. And the lesson learned here, and I've talked to other colleagues who are doing the same type of work that I'm doing now, they say that actually the upbringing, uh, starting from childhood, is very important. And therefore, in my program right now, we've already instituted another priority sub-program designed for children and the youth. And the UN now actually has started also putting priority on children and the youth. Because unless we start at that very young level, and unless we prepare the future leaders of what we, uh, we are, well, what we're doing now, which will not be finished within our generation, then we're not going to make any success at all. And so the lesson learned there is really start, they started young. And I wonder if Sherka can actually have a program which doesn't only look at you know, the graduate students, but I wonder if we can have a program where we are focused on the children of farmers. <coughs> You know, and, uh, and, and, and also bring them in into the fold, into the, into the work that we do and prepare them as future leaders to continue what we would succeed in within our own generations. Uh, the other thing that uh, really shaped my values uh, is that of uh, a study of history. And uh, I think many of us, when we uh, did go through uh, elementary and high school, had to read the lives of heroes. 
of the heroes of our country. And what would strike you when you read the heroes of our country is that how many of them actually did not do these things to be heroic or did it target to be heroes, but just the feeling that it must be done. And even at the sacrifice of this, their lives, this must be done. And it is for the country, for the society, for, 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 for people, especially those that you have to provide defense for. And so that, that also you know, shaped later on uh, my thinking about uh, the role that I had to play, that I had to find ways by which I could help society, even at the sacrifice of, uh, of myself. Now, my father is a forester, actually. But it was a time when forestry in the Philippines was really, it's, it's, it's not a desired profession. You don't even have to pass an exam to get to the college of forestry at the time. Uh, and you can actually be very poor if you are a forester. And in fact, my mother always uh, was telling us that you know you can be rich if you are part of the illegal illegal logging business. <laughs> but if you are not part of the illegal logging business, you're going to be poor because the salary of a forester is really really bad. And my father, you know, explained his frustrations about the profession so much so that I decided upon graduating from the Manila Science High School. And I was trained to be a scientist in the future. And was able to get an NSTB scholarship, was offered a scholarship by the mail to be a, uh, to take up uh, what, what, what was then a new course, management engineering, with, 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 with the dean of the bishops telling me, Delfin, come to Ateneo, take this course, and when you graduate, you see those big buildings in Makati? That will be your office. And I said, oh my God, I will be in an office. I have, I have to run away. I have to run away. I wanted to go to the forest and be like my father because I said, I'm going to go into forestry and change this profession. And, 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 and so when I decided eventually, after coming back as an exchange student from the U.S. for one year, and to take up forestry, my mother cried. She really cried and, uh, you know, because she felt that uh, it was, I don't know, they, they, it, it, it was not supposed to be my, my future. And even my teachers at the Manila Science High School felt that, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't make a good decision. But I pursued my dream of becoming a forester and joined the college of forestry. So the lessons learned here really is that uh, you have to go for, for what is your passion. And that passion is better when it is linked to a challenge that you want to pursue in the future. And in my case, it was really to change the forestry profession and deal with all the problems that we have had in forestry in the Philippines. When I got into UPLB, I, especially when I, went, I, I, I became a uh, and a scholar of uh, Sherpa. I was very lucky to get very good professors. And I would like to thank Dr. Sahise for being one of them. <laughs> and another was Dr. Romy Ramos, who was also a professor. He was the first one that was recruited in the College of Forestry to start teaching ecology. And there were only few, very few students that he was able to recruit into this field. Because everybody was saying, if you don't go into logging, you're going to be poor. So what's going to be your job if you're an ecologist? Of course, they didn't see the future at the time. But Dr. Sayese and Dr. Raros were what we were then calling in the college, uh, in, in the university, as the, as the lightning and the thunder. <laughs> Dr. Raros was lightning. He's the kind of, you know, if we must do it, let's do it now. No thinking about it, no planning. Let's be really the disruptive innovator is uh, Dr. Rana. So when uh, he wanted to try fire ecology in one of the farms in Mount Makiling, he wants to burn it down without waiting for the other scientists who are trying to look at the soil, the mites, the other insects, the vegetation. He wanted it to burn it down so that we can get results and study it. And Dr. Saisi became the funder 
Because you know, after the lightning, there's, there comes thunder. And uh, he will come and try to organize things, uh, actually sweep broken glasses, as we say, and, and try to make good whatever disruptive innovation was done by, by, by Dr. Roland Rallis. But the project that they got me involved was the hydroecology project, which was then a very innovative project where we tried to bring everybody into an interdisciplinary approach. And that's where I, I got to learn to try to work with many scientific fields. And, and it's not as easy as it seems. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> the lesson learned there is that it is important, but it is a hard, it's hard work to bring scientists together. Especially when, when I, I think we have to accept that the, the traditional scientific training is that they are siloed. No? You, you, a scientist will, if, if you're working on mites, you just work on mites. If you're working on a certain uh, species, you work on that, uh, that species. But that, that work uh, built in me the desire to really go into this and, and, and try to be leader enough and to try to learn how to facilitate to bring different scientific fields together, which became actually my work later on in the government and also later on in the UN, uh, UN managed uh, programs. Now the other thing that uh, shaped my, my work when I was a student was martial law. Martial law started in 1972, so when I came back from the U.S. As, as an exchange student, it was martial law. And I became a, an activist at, at the time, uh, a freshman activist, and uh, continued on for the next 14 years until martial law was lifted. And the thing that uh, really uh, became an experience was when, when I became part of the movement leadership team for Southern Tagalog. And the reason for that is that the previous leaders kept dying every two years. Uh, in fact, the first, the group that was immediately before my, my, my term as the leader for the Southern Tagalog movement were actually five faculty members of the They disappeared and then we, we just found out that they were, they were killed, they were tortured, and actually chopped into pieces. And so I came in then as the, move, the leader of the movement for Santo Tagalog. And uh, I remember I was uh, in a rally December 10, Human Rights, Human Rights Day, with, with then uh, Attorney Tanyan, who then became later on a uh, senator. And we were trying to get the march through uh, the, the roads, and, but we were blocked by the military. And when I talked to the commander of the military, I said, I'm nothing going to happen, I'm a faculty member of the, of the University of the Philippines, he said, oh, so you are nothing going to happen. We've been looking for you for quite a long time now. I said, I'm just in the university, you know. So anyway, so, but the, but, but the, but the you know, the, the, the activists want to really push through with the march. And so we decided that the next morning, everybody will push through even if all are arrested. So that was a, uh, so Bobby and I had to reflect that by morning, we would be, we would be, we would be arrested, we would be in jail. But these are situations actually that are very important because when you accept the sacrifice that you have to make, when you know that uh, you can die for what you are paid for, it, it is very liberating. And in fact, this is the thing that made me really accomplish my work later on when I got into government. After martial law, I was running around doing consultancies because I finished my doctorate, and because of my right choice to be the to be to take ecology, forest ecology, as my uh, doctorate course. I'm the only forest ecologist in the Philippines. And so, USAID had no choice but to get me as their consultant in their uh, rainfed resources development program. So I was running around, uh, you know, making good money in, 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 you know, 
better than, 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 than government or teaching. When I was told that I was already late in government because the president assigned my appointment as director of the Environmental Management Bureau. So they said, you know, don't uh, say no to the president, you're going to embarrass her. And anyway, you can come inside government and so instead of running around raising hell in the streets, you can change society and government policy within government itself. And naive that I was, I accepted and told my wife that I am accepting this appointment from the president. So first I said my mother cried, now my wife cried. <laughs> so I joined government and that was the start of uh, government post in two, in two presidents. First with President Aquino and later on with President Ramos. And I found out that, you know, government work is more difficult than being a street activist. You have to have patience, perseverance, you have to know how to speak the language of diplomacy, you have to be able to know rules and regulations, you cannot embarrass your president, you have to support the, your, your minister and your president. Uh, but the most difficult part really are, are, are the bribery and the threats. And government, I had to carry a gun. They gave me a bodyguard, <coughs> but then I found out that in the Philippines, if you have a bodyguard, you pay for his food. And from time to time, <laughs> you give him an allowance, and it was becoming very expensive, you know. And, and the salary of government in the Philippines is so low, that I always, every month, have to get money out of our bank account to cover, to cover expenses. So I, I dispense with the bodyguard. So they tried to give me a bulletproof vest. But when I tried it, you know, I look fat. So I said, I'd rather die than look fat. So they gave me a gun and gave me training with the military. But again, you know, uh, when you are very strict with, with government policy, and what I instituted at the time was a system of dirty dozen for polluting firms. Because I found out that our people were arresting very small industries, you know. Uh, a family, for example, that is uh, making ham for Christmas. While a big, big corporation is polluting the river and not, 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 being, not being caught. So I actually uh, adopted this from an experience from Indonesia. Um, where we, I asked every regional officer to identify 12 of the largest polluting firms and then let's go for the 12 polluting firms, even if they are the most influential people uh, in the country. And in fact, we had, we had to talk to the president one time because the owner of the soft drink factory, uh, Concepcion, was a best friend of the president. But she said, go ahead and we pursued it. But we got lots of uh, threats uh, of cases to be filed and lots of bad threats. So I had my gun, but uh, everybody was saying it doesn't matter. You know, if you had one gun, they'll bring two killers or three killers and you'll, you'll be dead. But the thing is that, uh, as I've said, when you accept that this is part of the sacrifice that you have to make for your country and for society, then it becomes easy. Uh, you're liberated, you're, you're, you're strong rather than weak when faced with these threats. Let me now proceed to when eventually I left government. I joined the United Nations uh, as global manager of the Small Grants uh, Program because it was a great way of, of continuing my activist work. It was still working with small communities where we were giving $50,000 per community and we had 128 countries all over the world where we are focusing on poor and vulnerable communities. The projects must always be environment, but it must be integrated with livelihoods and empowerment. And that's another lesson that uh, I can share that there's no community project out there with, with, in which you will get acceptance by the people and which you will get sustainability if it's just environment. It has to provide them sustainable livelihoods and eventually it has to empower them so that they will own the project, they will continue the project, and they can deal with outside forces that come to the community that will try to destroy 
uh, the, uh, the, the project. Uh, my work in the UN gave me the realization that the challenges we face are global and that the response must therefore be by all of us as a global community. And that's the other lesson learned that I have to, to impart to all of you. We cannot just do this work in our countries, not even in our region. It must be global or else we're not going to, uh, to make it. The indigenous peoples and local communities of the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, I found to really share similar issues as that in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, or in DR Congo, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. The issues of poverty and injustice and inequity are similar all over the whole place. And therefore, we cannot say that, oh, I'm, I'm only from Southeast Asia. I cannot help you in, in Latin America or in, in Africa. No, we can, we can actually uh, help each other. And in fact, one of the most important programs that we are starting right now is the South-South Exchange uh, program. And it's benefiting a lot of actually local communities, local farmers and fisher folks, as they try to share their experience and create the global networking that, uh, that, that we need. So let me, let me end by, by saying that uh, the problem we face is that uh, the challenges ahead of us are much more complex now. For agriculture, we are not only after agricultural production now, but we need to have climate smart, innovative agroecology. You see how complex it is now, because when, when, when we talk to the farmers about climate smart, innovative agroecology, they sort of scratch their head, what are you talking about? You know? And so it, it's going to take a lot more work. And in forestry, um, we have to work on community stewardship, not only small community by small community, we now have to scale this up to landscapes and seascapes. In uh, biodiversity work, we cannot just now be concerned with species. We have to link biodiversity with climate change. And so the, the challenges have become more complex. There's need for cross-sectoral collaboration. There's even need for time, longer time commitment to be able to deal with these problems. But on the other hand, there are also new developments right now that will make it uh, much easier for us in some ways. For example, when I was a student, I had to go to a certain place to just make a, a, a long distance telephone call. And you cannot even get the long distance telephone call while waiting for one hour. Now you have a smartphone, okay? You can call uh, another country free if you have Skype and so, the communication system, the, the digital technology, the big data technology is available now that we can use as tools. But again, you know that these are tools. My thinking is that really these tools are useless without the right values that we can bring in in the use of these uh, tools. Uh, one of the best titles given me uh, was that as boss chief when I was an activist not as the undersecretary uh, when I was in government, not as global manager that uh, now I have as in the UN, or the upcoming post of global leader for governance that I will now take in Singapore come January for uh, Worldwide Fund International. But when uh, but the, the title given to me when I visited uh, the Pacific Islands, and they called me a navigator, because in the Pacific Islands, the canoe, the voyaging of the canoe is the most important symbol. Because when you are together in a canoe, you have to work together. When you are in the vast ocean, you have to be one family, or else you will not survive. And together, you will take courage to look into the horizon, not even knowing where you're going, but having the courage to really go pioneer into a new direction. And the navigator is the one that looks at the stars. It's like tying your ambitions and dreams to the star. And take the canoe to new islands and expand the territory of the community. So 
let me end by saying that uh, may I invite you all to be voyagers in our canoe. Uh, I shouldn't be the navigator. Maybe Dr. Saise can be the navigator. <laughs> or some of our elders they can be the navigator. But uh, let's look at this symbolism of us being all in a canoe. Working together, having the courage to pioneer in new directions and be able to expand the horizons of our work. And so I guess um, if you read the book, uh, I like the title that was given me by the writer, and that was Change from the Two. And then the other article was Rebel. I like that. I show that to my children. You know, and tell them, you now have to also be change provocateurs and rebel. So to all of you, let's be voyagers in the same canoe, let's be change provocateurs, and let's all be rebels. Thank you. And I'm excited.